Uh, again, in this lecture, uh, we're going to walk through the development of foot hazards for a dam safety modification study. So much of what we've covered about this week is about building the foot hazards for um, earlier uh, risk assessments, what we call IES uh, um, ish, issue evaluation studies or periodic assessments. Um, so hopefully we've gotten into and seen and, and got a deeper knowledge into what, what kind of goes into the flood hazards. So, and you've got to see hopefully all that pulled together with the RD Bailey um, case study. So, but sometimes h, &H doesn't stop there. Um, sometimes we get to do some more work later on. So this presentation is going to look at that next step. So the core has, uh, you know, now for those members, the core, we have a dam safety modification. Um, study, so a DSMS, it's basically the point where we're just coming up with modifications um, on, or alternative modifications on how we might uh, modify the dam to reduce risk. So we're going <clears> to <throat> look at those, um, we're going to look at this case. So in general, most of these that we're looking at are still kind of ongoing process. They're in either a mod study or in the development or design of that phase. So when we're talking risk and um, the, the, the different information about these types of dams, you can't actually really talk about the dam itself and tell you where it is and what its, what its name and location. So anyway, for this case study, it's a real dam, it's a real study, just calling it Dam A. So from here forward, you'll, you'll see it referred to as Dam A. So, so we'll talk briefly about the process that goes into the DSMS framework and see how we fit, how our h, &H part fits into that. Um, of course, this, this one's going to be driven by overtopping, which is an, uh, one of our key drivers that we usually are involved in on. And so we'll step through that DSMS process. Um, we'll, again, discuss a little bit of how h, &H kind of fits in the updates for those alternatives that we're, they were looking at, and then look at how they identified the plan. So. Here's a little bit of background. So Dam A, of course, is a, like a, it's a use -ace dam, so authorized like many others for flood control, water supply, hydropower, navigation, um, fish and wildlife, the, kind of the standard authorizations. Um, it's located, this thing was located approximately about 50 miles upstream, upstream of a kind of a bigger um, city, but a, a bigger population center, so it has kind of high consequences. Um, the dam has, on the left and right, a rolled embankment has a left and right concrete um, gravity spillway, non-overflow section, and then it has the uh, gravity concrete spillway section with, with two hydropower units. So kind of a basic dam, embankment on the side, concrete in the middle, you got your hydropower with your tanner gates. <clears throat> so after the IES, um, basically looking at the FN chart, we have a total risk kind of well up here above the, t this, the, the tolerable risk guideline, it's primarily, there's other failures, but it's primarily being driven by PFM3, which is the overtopping failure. So that's kind of the outcome from the, the previous risk assessment at this point, the IAS version of it. So, so just for reference, like um, if, just, just talking about what we're doing this week, like the, building the hazard curve, the loading curve, right? It, this one basically has a system response of one within a half foot or a foot of overtopping. And so in general, this thing's being, you can think of it, it's basically being driven pretty heavy by your loading curve. So what you've done in your, your preliminary analysis, all your work you've done with H&H &H that they've informed the IES, your risk assessments, it pretty much drove this this loading. Now, of course, if it didn't have very much consequences, it wouldn't. So your, your two kind of parts of the, the three equations, so the loading, you have this, the performance and the consequences, those, those two are, you know, loading has a big part of it, so does consequences. System response, the, the middle people, that's their, they didn't have much of a part on this one, at least with that failure mode. So here's the adopted um, final loading curve they use for the risk assessment. So it might be a little hard to tell, but the, the PMF, um, over here uh, at the top is about 2e minus 5 AEP, or like a 1 in 50,000 year. So um, if you remember that the system response, the overtopping is basically a 1e minus 5, so there's just, it's just a, a slight 
a, a slight difference between the, the loading of the overtopping and the, the actual final total risk there of it. So now the end of the uh, risk assessment for the IES concluded that the risks were uh, you know, above the tolerable risk guideline. And so they made the recommendation to move on to a DSMS, a, a dam safety modification study, to look at possible alternatives. All right, so this is for the core and other agencies might take it, but these are core guidelines. So here's it. we have our ER um, 100, it has kind of lays out a six step process and we have ER 50, 1156. So um, the six step, um, so anyway, I forgot to say that ER 100 is the planning guidance notebook and 1156 is the safety for, of dams for and policies and policies and procedures. So the six step framework um, that's here is a kind of a guide and effective and, and efficient process for coming up with the with your plans. So as you can read here, you can start for, you start by identifying the plans and opportunities. You evaluate the future conditions given those um, problems. Um, and then you just, it's just a matter of coming up with, you know, alternatives. You know, coming up with alternatives, you evaluate those alternatives, you compare those alternatives through this process, and then you can make your selected plan. So, but again, you know, like this framework really is defined by, um, it's defined by in the context of the 1150, ER 1156, the safety of dams, um, from the basic idea that coming up with a plan that's effective and efficient, uh, it efficiently reduces the risk, but still holding to the principle of do no harm. So we don't wanna make an alternative that causes additional harms to downstream community, other different um, authorizations. So it's the trick is coming up with a fix that doesn't actually create a problem for something else. So. Based on those ERs, DAMA had some specific objectives and constraints. The objectives were identified and recommended in the risk management plan. So RMP, risk management plan, which supports the um, expeditious and cost-effective reduction of the risk to achieve individual and societal total risk limits. So getting it back below that guideline, right? But there are some constraints that go with the objective, things uh, like not, uh, not to transfer or create risk that harms the public, so do no harm. There's, um, you also wanna minimize uh, the, the non-breach risk downstream, which tends to be a tricky when you're addressing an overtopping failure, because you tend to need to either increase release potentially or do something and that has the potential to increase non-breach risk. So you kinda have to be careful with those alternatives. Um, but of course, again, we just wanna minimize the impact of other authorizations too, like hydropower or the water supply, you don't wanna do something that causes those to, to devalue or harm. So there's always the possibility of new information coming along when you do a new risk assessment, um, something that might've been missed, something new information that might be learned. So for Dam A, the team came together and they worked through the obvious problems that was a, was they reviewed the problems that were, the, the, the failures that were in the IS as, and of course they concluded the primary overtopping failure with a couple of internal erosion ones. But during the process, they actually came up with, uh, for the existing conditions risk assessment, um, the, the process, they, they, they identified a couple additional stilling basin failure modes and gate re reliability failure modes. So they actually came up with a couple more failure modes in the DSMS. Hopefully, I mean, that can happen. It's just an additional risk assessment. They found more information. They came up with more failures. So if you remember uh, from the first slide, where our tolerable risk was sitting. Um, now with the, uh, just above, I guess the 20 minus five there. So um, now with the, I think the, oh, there it goes. With the additional information, with the additional failure modes, uh, the total, so overtopping is, overtopping still where it was roughly, but the total went way up because of some of the other failures. So we're gonna be, kind of seeing the rest of this way with these, based on the total failure, total uh, risk is kind of way up here above 1E minus four. And we're gonna be trying to get that thing back down below the hell of a risk guideline through this process. So the overtop and failure. So let's start looking at this for existing conditions. Um, so you probably have an idea of the problem. So, it's typical overtopping. How would you, how would we typically 
address this? Do you have any ideas of how you would attempt to address an overtopping failure? What you would consider? Just alternatives. Just if we have an alternative failure, we're in a modification study. We're going to try to figure out an alternative. Raise the dam, increase spillway. Anything else? Okay. So in this overall, and we'll cover all these things. So in, in this in this particular PMF, so what was considered was the pool had been previously filled to the top of a flood pool um, due to whatever multiple events, downstream constraints, couldn't get rid of the water, right? Um, so it, it filled to slightly below the uh, top of flood pool. And then when the PMP starts, the inflow, of course, rises, your spillway capacity is unable to keep up with it, and the pool eventually goes above the top of dam. This is just kind of going through our normal top. It stays overtopping for a certain duration, peaking approximately about six feet over the top of the dam. Um, and then, so generally, we see the problem. You know, we got a lot of overtopping here. So, okay. So, some, I think you mentioned some of the basic things you might see is like dam raise, spillway modifications. You might do both a dam raise and a spillway modification. You might have you know, operational changes. You look at the different water supply or water uh, control plans, maybe it's a system of dams and you might be able to do something. You have auxiliary spillways built in. Anyway, there's a, lot, a number of things. So we'll go, we'll kind of go through. So part of the second step of, of this process is forecasting conditions. So the team looks at future without action conditions, and this is meant to identify the conditions that's most likely to exist, um, you know, over the next 50 years or so, if nothing is done. So the WAC, so the future without conditions, provides a basis for which the RMPs can be formulated and their benefits and impacts to be evaluated and compared. So basically, if we have some idea of what the conditions will look like 50 years down the road, then we can you know, have something to compare and shoot for with the alternatives. So FY considers the, the four components here, uh, an interim risk reduction measure plan, so IRMP, uh, which for overtopping, for this case, when they looked at it, there's really not much could be done to really change it. Like if you lower the pool a lot, given how much water's coming in, it still overtops. Because it's, I mean, again, it's six, seven foot of overtopping for well over a day. It's a lot of volume. So that's not much they can do, even if they drain the lake quite a bit. So you have, they looked at future operations and maintenance, which they do a lot of anyway. They have a pretty good maintenance team. They have a, a lot of... Um, operations and forecasting and everything they can to do to help with both like the maintenance and the flood fighting and surveillance and basically the, the, a lot of the things that you call like non-structural alternatives there was not a lot of options that they couldn't find at least at first so and then we look at the factors that affect the loading and the consequences so how can we change the actual loading and how can we change consequences so <clears throat> So, but however, when it comes to consequences on this project, when they looked at the 50 year population growth, it was showing about a 33% increase. So, well, how can you change the loading? We'll answer that. Well, you're gonna, yeah, we'll, we'll look at it here and you'll hopefully do it in the workshop, but how does the loading, what affects the loading of a, what affects the stage frequency curve, the loading curve? What goes into the, what what is a what is a one of the key factors that goes into a stage frequency curve? So you have volume frequency. Yeah. In, I know reservoir routing. So what what can you change if we're talking about dam overtopping? Yeah 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 yeah. Well oh, yeah you're getting confused. Okay I see what the question is. Now I get it mixed up. Yeah future without action you're not really changing any operations or yeah 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 yeah. Oh, I get it I get it sorry yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking alternatives for the future. Anyway, okay, all right. Um, anyway, uh, we're looking at ignorant risk with or without intervention. Anyway, so, okay. So moving to the third step, it's the brainstorming um, phase. So we're gonna brainstorm and screen risk management plans, RMPs again, for the primary risk driver, um, which is what we're gonna be looking at is overtopping, but they do have some, a couple of others with the gate failures and the stilling basin. So, the team produced um, 16 structural measures out of this and nine non-structural measures. And then they kind of talked this through and they came up with um, a few less. Uh, they kind of screened down 
through the process, through thinking all through, they actually came down to like three main structural um, processes and one non-structural. So now this process, of course, considered criteria that focus on focus back on the study objectives and constraints, things like um, the effectiveness, the cost of the project, the the risk transfer to other areas. You're looking at non-breach consequences, societal um, effects and impacts on other authorized purposes. So maybe it's a little hard to read. The process to refine the RMPs, again, um, they took several iterations, but worked themselves down to three basic structurals and, and one non-structural. Uh, the the non-structural is basically ends up being FWAC with no action. So basically leave the project as it is. <laughs> I'm not sure how that's classified as it. Huh? It can include non yeah, operational changes that they identified that they couldn't change the operations yeah. effectively. So, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> basically the, on this project, the non-structurals kind of end up wiping out and they don't really have any non-structural, they only have the structural changes. Um, so again, remember back to maybe what you're thinking for uh, alternatives for overtopping. Um, so the three main ones that came up with is a dam raise. So using all existing um, conditions, just raise the dam. Uh, number six is that our, our MP6 was a new auxiliary spillway um, and a modification to the existing spillway. And then the, the other one was both uh, a new gated spillway and raise the dam, so do both. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about is those. We're going to go, we're going to go through like kind of the H and H process of when when they select alternatives like this and how we can help uh, with this process. Click, click. I forgot to click through. <laughs> Making a bone. All right. So, and just to note, I guess um, what they actually ended up doing is they they took a couple of these like the. Uh, the dam raise with the existing spillway, they broke it into a, a couple different sections. So they have 5A and a 5C. 5C is basically adding an extra foot on top of whatever they were going to design because that helps um, eliminate the gate failure reliability failure PFM. So it was basically the FA or 5A and 5C are the same thing, except C is addressing an additional failure mode by adding an extra foot. Um, the difference between 6 and E and 6G um, is one is a, a regular like gated spillway and modification of the existing spillway, and the other one is a, a labyrinth spillway. So it's regular gated spillway, one's labyrinth spillway. So anyway, as we go through these, that's these are the ones we're focused on: is the 5A, C, 6A, E, and G, and 7, and then 9 is no action. So that's always a possible alternative to do nothing which we have other dams that have come through our portfolio with high consequences, not as high as you know, above the t TRG as this one, and still no action be done because any action would have caused non-breach failure to increase more than what they wanted to, to, to handle. So anyway, you can come into DSOG and not do something as a no action. <laughs> um, all right, let's cover a little more detail on each one of these, just so you have a good idea. So arm. RMP5 is basically a raise of the dam to be able to store more water, right? So, um, so the stealing basin modification that goes with this is more about addressing um, a couple of the other failure modes. So the dam raise is a continuous, is a combination of a parapet wall over the concrete section and uh, raising the, the embankment part, the center line of the embankment. So there, it's either going to be a, it's approximately a six to seven foot raise for this case. So. You're going to be tying into high ground on both sides. And, and, and again, note the really only difference between 5A and C is just that extra foot for the gate failure um, reliability uh, uh, failure mode. So uh, one interesting, maybe of interest, uh, construction plan for the 5 RMP5 was uh, they were going to build on the upstream side uh, of the existing spillway to help protect for the tanner gates they're going to build some hydraulic baffles locks on the upstream side to help it 
um, protect the tenor gates. Um, and I'll show you like, oh, I just to mention the peak release is less, in this case, it ends up being less than the future without action condition. But these are the baffle blocks they plan to put in front of the tenor gates. It basically lower the nap of the, it, it forces it to be lower than the tenor gates. So it's just an interesting concept that they did to just help. Because you always run into that, or trying to go from that orifice and free flow and try to keep the gates from being over top and hit anyway. They were going to design some baffle block, uh, hydraulic baffle blocks on the upstream side, up on the structure. That was interesting. No big deal. So um, RMP6, which is 804 foot gated spillway. Um, so, and they were going to modify the stilling basin, but uh, basically this thing was going to be built in the right abutment over here. And, um, and again, this was going to be, it's going to be built to provide more release capacity uh, to pass the current PMF. So uh, a new spillway would include um, a new appro spillway approach, a new gated structure, a new shallow sloping chute to minimize the embankment um, evacuation, uh, how much they had to, uh, to excavate, I guess. So, and then 6G is very similar, except it's a labyrinth um, spillway. So again, it'd be built in the right, ab right abutment, <clears throat> and it was going to basically be built in a way that the PMF would peak out right about a half foot. Of, um, it's not, it would start, the crest of it would be above the top of third charge, so you'd have the same releases up to surcharge, um, but then it would basically be built so the, the PMF would be right at the, the, the original top of dam instead of providing a lot of freeboard. So again, because it's going to be the PMF in this case is going to be really close to the top of dam, they're still going to have to build the hydraulic baffle blocks to help protect the gates. So just more, it's just cost that they're weighing out. So, and then RMP7 was going to be a 900 foot, 904 foot auxiliary spillway, again, built off into the, the right embayment. Um, they were also going to need to raise the dam by four feet, and they would have to decommission the existing spillway. Um, Essentially, what this is, is they're going to be building a new dam. <laughs> a dam raise and a whole new spillway, decommissioning the other one. It's, going to, it's a massive project. So the, the next step along the way is then now we've got to evaluate those final array of RMPs uh, against the FWAC condition. Um, so the goal, of course, is to determine the level of risk reduction each one of these um, RMPs uh, have in relation to the future without action condition. So some of the criteria from the, from the principles and guidelines of the dam uh, for dam A was effectiveness, which is essentially the reduction in the annual probability of failure and the average um, annual life loss. You have efficiency, so the most cost-effective means of achieving that desired risk. You have completeness, so which one provides and accounts for all the investments and actions, and you have acceptability in terms of the law, regulation, and other policies. And then you have the other other ca categories that you want to look at, like the robustness, the redundancy, resiliency, and of course, do no harm. So you're trying to take all this into consideration when you're comparing these um, RMPs. So as part of the process to evaluate and compare RMPs, uh, especially to the FWAC, uh, for the effectiveness part of this, is the process to analyze how the structural modifications to the dam changes the hydrology. So, what changes when what changes when we modify the dam's crest or spillway? We modify the crest or the spillway? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, the reservoir model spillway. Um, what else? Does the PMP change? Does your inflow change? The outflow? Yeah. Does your PMF change? Just the, yeah, just the elevation? Does it go up or down? Both? Yeah, well, once you have a design, it's the IDF. I'm just calling it, I'm just calling it, your final design is a, is your inflow design, but we're just calling it PMF. Your, 
Yeah, to get fun. Your your design IFF could be good, different than your PMF. You can design to alert. Anyway, there's a whole other process of that. So, <laughs> so risk conform design is what we're doing. So right, you should expect changes um, in the PMF elevation and outflow hydrographs when we're talking about modifications. So uh, what about the loading curve? What changes would you expect in the loading curve? Shift it to the right. You shift your loading to the right. <laughs> It's a good explanation. You have more release, the lower elevations at a more frequent uh, current, so it shifted to the right. Uh, what about just it with the dam rays? Yeah, we're not talking the hazard part of it. We're just talking the loading curve. <laughs> so theoretically, up to the original top of dam, it's the same curve. If you raise the dam, instead of bending over with additional outflow, which you might have on some dams, now you don't have that additional outflow of overtopping. You just have your spillway. So the curve could technically go up. Anyway, this one, it, you'll see it actually just keeps going up. You don't get that much outflow capacity as with the overtopping. So it doesn't, it just keeps going up. Okay, so just comparing. So we're looking at um, RMP 5A and C where the modification again is a dam raise. So yes, with a higher dam crest elevation with no additional release capacity, the peak uh, PMF, uh, elevation would be expected to go up from the existing um, conditions, uh, and, and that's what we're seeing. You see, like a slight little increase up here in the PMF elevation over the original, um, and the same thing. You might have a little bit different outflow, so the outflow is stretched out a little bit more um, versus the original outflow. So you don't have quite as much overtopping peak. That's in this little part right here. You don't get that overtopping now. So it's all just going through the spillway. So it's a little bit more attenuated as the, on the outflow. So that's kind of what you expect with the dam raise. So for the RMP6E, where we are building an auxiliary spillway to get a whole lot more release, um, what you expect is a really good drop in the PMF elevation where we actually have freeboard again for the original design. Now, of course, that means we're gonna get a lot more release um, compared to what we were doing. So, <laughs> yeah, it, I think the, it's a weird dilemma. Like, I think the levees, I, I think it's, you're looking at the, the actual risk, the consequence. And anyway, so like, I think, I don't remember the exact numbers on this. Like the levees are like 200, 250,000 is what they hold. And so like, you're, I don't think, I think when it came out in the actual, yeah, the numbers weren't that different because everything's gone anyway with such a big spillway event. It's like it's got to go look at the project, and the project reduces the peak. Oh, yeah, it definitely reduces the peak. It's when you peak flow. Oh, the peak inflow. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you have an alternative that releases the inflow or more, but do no harm is still the non breach. So if this to here greatly increases your non breach, life loss, then you're causing, there's harm. I know, it's tough. It's tough. It's, there's, it's kind of a, it's a kind of a wiggle room. I think on this one, I think by the numbers, they're so big and, it's, and this is so much overwhelms the downstream that it kind of washes out a little bit. All right. Um, so RMP6G is the labyrinth where not as much release capacity, but some additional release capacity compared to the, the, the FWAC condition. It lowers it down to the top of dam. So um, this is what you expect. You get some additional release, but not all the way to get you back to freeboard. So you get a drop here. And you're not quite as much increase in outflow here. So maybe not as bad of um, increase in non-breach downstream. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Because this one's designed so that um, the, the surcharge, this, the labyrinth was built at the surcharge pool. The, the idea was that the, the releases above that would, yeah. And then you have the dam raise plus and a whole new auxiliary spillway. So it's going to bring it about down to the top of the dam. I know this is funny. They, they brought it down to where it's basically just passing um, right at the top of the dam, not with it. Um, but the outflow stays about the same, yeah. So they're able to get a little bit more flow, get it down, but they can raise the dam up. So you're not really increasing outflow for non-breach. You're, you're building the dam up enough so you can pass the PMF, so you can eliminate that or exclude that failure mode. 
But you're basically building a new dam. So this loading curve for the FWAC and the RMP, so here's the loading curve for them. So what do you notice with the loading curves? There, so there's at, least four, there's at least five loading curves here. And you can, you can see three. Just one thing to note on here, that they're, these things are truncated just for display purposes. So you can see like these are truncated at the estimated top of PMF, the design that they would have for each one. So it's just there to, otherwise they'll keep going up, but just for these purposes, we kind of truncated them. So um, the loading again is basically because we have the same releases up to about search edge. So loading is basically about the same up to that point. Um, and then we've got the, the, the couples that are um, just dam raises, the five, um, A, C, and then the seven, which are basically very similar release, raised dam. So the loading carrier just kind of keeps going up. Again, this isn't, this, you don't get a lot more overtopping capacity compared to the actual spillway release. So it doesn't, in this case, it doesn't bend hard once you get overtopping. So but if, it, if the curve bent hard at overtopping and you raise dam, then you would expect a curve that's over here and then a raising one, the one that goes up here like this. But in this case, you don't get a lot of outflow capacity. So the loading just keeps going straight up for any of those cases, the FWAC and the dam raise additions. And then you got these two, which are the, the RMP6s, which are the increased releases. So increased release, in your mind, you should know increased release means you raise more operations and your RFA model has changed. You're getting more outflow per elevation. It should shift right. If it doesn't shift right, if it does something different, red flag, please. This we point these out because these are things we have caught before in review. Somebody increased their release and their loading didn't change. And that and people were asking why. And it was because there was a mistake. So so um again, our overtopping is right around here just for reference on our FN chart as we go through this. So Looking at FA, uh, RMP uh, 5A and 5C, where the modification again is the overtopping. Um, what happens to PFM 30? What happens to that thing with the modifications for dam rays? What's going to happen to the PFM 30 with dam rays? The, so the total, so what, is, what just happens to PFM 30? First, answer that. Overtopping. What, what happens to the overtopping failure mode? You, it, it doesn't, it do, yeah, it goes down. It, you get rid of it. It's excluded. We don't have a failure anymore, right? It no longer plots because we've, in theory, you've, you've built the dam to the upper bound that you think it could, it's going to possibly happen, right? So it, it's excluded. Now, with the exclusion of the overtopping fail, failure, you drop the total risk about two orders of magnitude, about kind of back down to the um, TRG line there. The change is it the change of the total risk is due primarily to what? Overtopping being eliminated, right? What about the loading curve, your hazard? Does that have any effect in this drop? Your other failure modes at? Yeah, the, on this dam with the plots are basically the same loading, then the loading curve that we, we looked at as we we're updating this for this DSMS for, the, for their team, it really didn't have any effect on this. Now, if you did have one that bent at the top of dam and now it doesn't bend and the failure mode was up there and it was one of these somehow, then... And then again, that was, this is with 5A, which does not include um, the extra foot for the gate reliability. So, we have go to 5C, which does include the foot for reliability. So just one more foot, you get that additional drop. So you basically eliminate two failure modes. So this, that's what, you know, just talking about 5C versus 5A, you add that extra foot. So nothing else has changed for us in the H&H &H world. It's just basically it eliminates that gate reliability. So it drops it down that other half more than order magnitude to get it to where, it won't, where you needed it. All right. So... 6E was the gated spillway. Um, so we saw a, basically we saw somewhere around a full order magnitude shift in the loading curve. So what difference do you think is going to happen here with uh, 
the increased spillway. What do you think is going to happen with the failure mode? Uh, oversight and failure mode. The failure mode should go away. And then what do you think? So you've got an order magnitude shift in the loading and the failure mode goes away. What do you think will happen to the total risk? So these are things like you should intuitively kind of grasp. So when you do your analysis or you're doing risk, you should come out with results that kind of expect, right? So this thing drops. Well, the circle is wrong in this place, so it's not over here. But <laughs> the point is it drops from over here. It drops way down um, by basically removing. Yeah, so because we've changed the loading and we've changed, we've eliminated failures. No. Not really. They, that's the thing. Like the life loss doesn't really change a lot for this, whether you're increasing the releases some or not. Um, it shifts a little bit. It's yeah. So the other one was like right in here. It's just it's moving a half order magnitude over, I guess. So it's it's going to change some, but I mean it's not. This one's not dramatic. I, well, I mean, this is incremental, so you might have increased your non-breach and in reducing your incremental. <laughs> yeah, so like this one has a 33% population increase, but yet it looks like it actually has a little bit of decrease in the incremental. But again, if you're, I don't know the exact numbers on all this. If the incremental, if the non-breach went up, um, it's possible your incremental actually went down. <laughs> Um, a little bit. So it's an oddity of the numbers. Yeah, this one, again, they are, and we're not going into them, they are trying to treat some of the spillway failures inside of these as well, some of the other failures, but they're not H&H, &H and I didn't really, really care to go too much into those. But that's probably having some of the fact. So one of the things that we were just trying to make note is like, when you change things and you're doing alternatives and you're going to change you're releasing your operations. The point is you're going to change the hazard and that hazard should have effect on here. So just that's kind of what we're kind of going through just so you can see the, some of this stuff. So Labyrinth, we're um, again, reducing, eliminating, overtopping, increasing releases a little bit. Um, but, and it doesn't quite, because the releases aren't quite as much, it doesn't quite get the same shift in the loading curve. So you're just about another order of magnitude or so higher here in the overall total risk. And then, of course, seven is um, more similar because we're basically raising the dam where our releases are about the same. Um, it's very similar to five, RMP5, so to, which is why we end up uh, about the same area as 5C. Because you basically eliminate the failure mode, you eliminate the gate reliability. You don't increase, you don't really change downstream releases, so the consequences aren't really changing. So anyway, the hazard, the loading curve hasn't changed. So you basically, seven, RMP7 and RMP5C are basically about the same. All right, so with the H&H &H updated, again, that's kind of in the effectiveness part of this of that comparison. Um, then we got to look at the other um, pieces of it. So I, I think somewhere in here we can see like the consequence numbers changing. Um, yeah, I think it's just the incremental just went down <laughs> with the, with probably increased, increased rate. So for efficiency, again, the team looked at the, uh, first cost estimate. So as you expect, raising a dam with some stilling basin modifications would probably cost less than constructing a new spillway in the right abutment. And then RMP seven is more like a um, kind of it's a combination of five and six. So you're really closer to a dam. So these costs are like, I don't know if you can tell. So um, some of the costs just on the project's first cost, the, the raising the dam were just a little bit under half a billion. Um, but then we jumped to one and a half for six and then almost three billion for the full design. So first cost between the comparison is a big difference, big range right there. So. And then you got cost of overhead um, or operations over time. So um, having multiple spillways that six would have is going to cost more than just one spillway. And then that new one is just expensive. So looking at the efficiency, the cost of it, um, acceptability um, and completeness. So completeness 
uh, they just want to make sure it met all the guidelines and reduced the risk. And basically all of them mainly meet the societal guideline, except for that one five A that was really close, but it's not, it's pretty close to there. And then you have acceptability, which means they all um, were designed to meet the laws and regulations and policies, which of course they were done. So final comparisons early in this evaluation process, the team moved forward with out RMP 5A, simply because it didn't meet the, that one desired risk of that gate failure, but they continued with the other, the other ones. So for several of the other criteria, the team assigned a high, medium, low ranking system so they can kind of compare the different ones. So this might be a little bit hard to see, but so on here they had um, the additional ones, they had like the robustness, redundancy, resiliency, environmental impacts, and societal impacts. And you might notice pretty quick um, after cost, seven was eliminated pretty quick, right? Like it's almost, I mean, it's whatever, it's like eight times the cost of the, the just the dam race by itself. Um, and then <clears throat> later on, I think they, uh, they ultimately, you know, I was trying to see, they, they looked at the other ones, basically ultimately deciding that, you know, these two with the increased releases and increased operational maintenance, because you have two spillways, there's a lot of extra costs. You don't get that much. You get a lot more um, re risk reduction of the 6E, but is it really worth the cost? So in, in the end, they ended up looking at the overall um, final decision, final comparison, final numbers, and they were going to go with 5C as the, the best cost for getting it below the risk guideline. So basically in summary, like this is a process that the core follows using, you know, ER 100 and ER 1156, kind of that set six step process to kind of go from start to finish of understanding the problem to selecting the plan. Um, and then, you know, several other things just meeting all that criteria. So during the process, because the RMPs were addressing the overtop and failure, you know, we got to redo the H and H um, for the and reanalyze the H and H given the new alternative. So there are opportunities past your risk assessments and even in, so even in design to be able to go in and redo H and H and make sure you have the proper loading and proper PMF uh, that the teams are going to use to evaluate those alternatives because you can you do find mistakes even after six or set, five or six years and you somebody reviews it and finds there was errors. Um, so DQC and ATR, because that does come up. <laughs> so, um, so as you expect, uh, with modifications to a dam, either a, a dam raise or a spillway modification, you know, the hydrology is going to change. And, and so that might mean small differences in PMF or, or large with, with PMF elevation or releases, which can result in, you know, significant changes in the loading and your PMF elevation that you're going to have. So run each RMP and just to see if it comes out with intuitively what you expect it to come out with. So again, in, this, in the summary of this particular uh, modification was uh, 5C with the seven foot dam raise, which kind of for the gate reliability was picked. Um, it excluded PFM, PFM 30 out of it and it addressed multiple other failures dropping, being able to drop the total risk below the total risk guideline here. So again, we just kind of walk through the DSMS process just to have a general feel for where we kind of fit in the H&H &H world in that process. And just knowing that we got to, you got to run your H&H &H for new modifications. And then that provides information back to the team to be able to make final alternative decisions. So that's a simple DSMS case where we got to do a little bit of H&H &H updates.